Thank you very much. And very happy to be here. Um, my name is Seema Chetal, and I run the institutional funds business for JP Morgan. Basically, what that means is that I work with family offices and smaller institutions and invest on their behalf. And they usually are looking for investments that are more niche or you know, early, you know, early in their thematics and maybe concentrated. So that is across all asset classes in the private area, private equity, private credit, real estate, and, and, and venture. And I agree that this panel is absolutely amazing. And Vidal has done a great job putting it together. I've been speaking with these people, and I think it's going to be a great conversation. Um, I am going to hand over the mic or just ask uh, Michelle to talk about herself. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Seema. And good afternoon, everyone. I'm Michelle Davidson. I'm a partner with Axia. We're a specialist uh, consulting firm focused exclusively on alternatives. We have about 300 billion of assets that are advisement or management. Uh, we do not have commingled products, but we will manage bespoke, uh, customized, separate accounts for clients that need support in that regard. Uh, I've spent about 30 years focused exclusively on private markets. Started on the investment side, but always worked with clients. And today, I co-head our America's advisory team and sit on our private equity investment committee. Thank you. Mike Zelenich, I lead the secondary activities at Apigen, which is a uh, division of New York Life. We have a hybrid approach, which we'll be talking a little bit about what that means today, which means that we provide liquidity to limited partners and also to general partners. I've been executing secondaries for 15 years, started my career like many good investors on the credit side, where I was credit trained at uh, two middle market banks, including Merrill Lynch, and uh, happy to talk about this topic today. It's a very exciting time in secondaries. I think one of probably the, uh, pro a little bit of an outlier conversation relative to the rest of the agenda uh, today, a little more conventional than, you know, some of the topics that were discussed and, and hopefully uh, rewarding to you all. Awesome. Um, well, we'll echo what Mike just said, I think, about our excitement about secondaries. I, I'll, I'll throw this out in the wind, but not claim credit for it. One of my partners described this recently as sort of the golden era of secondaries. Uh, and so we're obviously very excited about it as well. My background, Matt Roche, I'm a managing director at Stepstone. Uh, I've spent my whole career with the firm. Stepstone, like Axia, we're a, a private markets advisor, consultant, and asset manager as well. Uh, I advise on about $600 billion of client capital deploying 80 ish billion dollars per year into the private markets. That's across private equity, private credit, real estate, uh, and infrastructure as well. Uh, it's a great to be here. Uh, my name is Tom Smith. I'm the founder and managing partner of Savano Capital Partners based out of Baltimore, Maryland. And uh, we're definitely a niche strategy, SEMA, compared to the rest of the crowd here. Uh, Savano is a player in the direct secondary market. Uh, what that means is that we target companies, not uh, fund managers, not GPs or LPs. We target uh, what we consider to be high octane, high growth, uh, established tech companies. And we provide secondary liquidity to their individual shareholders, typically not the institutions, but the typical company we invest in is a $100 million revenue uh, software company that's growing 20 to 30% a year, has been around for 10 or 12 years or more, uh, will invariably have two or three or four institutional investors on their cap table that might own 20, 30, 40, 50% of the business. The rest of the business is owned by hundreds of people like you in the audience, angel investors, founders, executives, employees who've come and gone from the company. And we provide uh, those individual shareholders liquidity, which you can imagine in this uh, market environment is, uh, is pretty valuable for them and enables us uh, an access point to invest in very high quality companies that don't otherwise need capital. So uh, we uh, a little bit different than the rest yeah. of the group here, but enjoy the benefits of the broader secondary environment. And I agree with Matt, it is the golden era of secondaries. I've been focused on this market for 15 years, and uh, it's as good a market environment for secondaries up and down the spectrum that I've seen in the 15 years that I've been doing it. I'm sure we'll talk more about that as we get into things. 
Thank you, Tom, and thank you for that introduction. So just taking things back a little, what is a secondary? A secondary means that you're not investing in the fund when it's first launched. Usually after year three or four or five or six or seven or eight, when the fund is has started, has invested some money, now the LPs in the fund want some liquidity. Somebody else comes in and steps into their position. That's why they're in a secondary position. They're not buying, investing in the fund as a primary. They're coming in as a secondary. And I will ask Michelle and everybody, everybody else, please chime in as to what are you hearing? Why is this a golden era for secondaries? So Michelle, what are you hearing from your clients? And also for the audience, if you can demystify, what are, the, there are many specialists on this team here. Uh, so we will talk to them and talk about that particular kind of secondaries that they do. But maybe you can start with a general uh, information about what different kinds of secondaries are. Thank you. Mm. Sure. And uh, given the title of our panel, Evolution in the Secondary Market, I thought talk a bit, little bit about the evolution and what we've seen take place over the last few years and how it's changed and, and what we're seeing today, as well as some stats on the current market. Uh, so we certainly have seen a lot of evolution. Uh, you know, the genesis was really an LP seller's market focused on selling portfolios. Uh, most of the transactions that occurred were you know, pension fund driven, sovereign wealth fund driven. Um, often it was because of the denominator effect. We saw a lot of transactions happen post GFC where they were over their target allocations and you know, decided to sell. Uh, wasn't a great time to be a seller, but you know, distress necessitated that in some cases. There was also a lot of regulatory selling. Uh, with the Volcker rule, banks had to retreat from private equity in particular. Uh, so that was driving a lot of the market. And then a few years ago, we began to see a real shift towards GP-led secondaries, where we were saying we have great assets, we're not ready to part with them. Um, we can sell either single asset or portfolio of assets to generally secondary firms and other buyers, or often LPs were given the opportunity to roll their stakes into this new vehicle as well, was called a continuation fund. And that actually became the majority of the market uh, within the last couple of years. But recently we've seen a shift back towards more LP driven selling. We've seen less driven by a denominator impact this time. It's really been a shift more towards a portfolio management tool. So on the sell side, you know, pensions largely have been winnowing down their legacy relationships. Uh, they've decided they have too many managers in their roster. They need to uh, call that a bit. Um, you know, also, if there's areas where they have too much concentration, they've decided to sell off and change the mix a bit. And then there's a lot of new investors coming into the space who are focused on, you know, or new portfolios who are focused on J-curve mitigation. They want to get instant diversification. They can backfill exposure via secondary purchases. So it's been a great tool in that regard. But today, you know, we're definitely seeing a lot more GP-led deals. Um, I think in a muted exit environment, it's one way where you know, GPs can drive liquidity, um, show some distributions back to LPs, especially when those LPs are saying, okay, yeah, well, you're fundraising, but you haven't shown any exits from your prior fund. So how are you going to uh, achieve that? So a great way for them to be able to do that is to you know, execute a couple of continuation deals, show some distributions. Um, you know, LP reaction to that is a little bit different. Uh, it just depends on how it's structured. And we'll, we'll talk about continuations funds in a lot more detail, so I won't go uh, too deep here. But we're really starting to see those come back to life. And in fact, I've seen 12 opportunities you know, from the LP side just in the last two weeks. Um, but that... I was just going to just quickly touch on the fundraising environment. Yeah. Um, there's a little bit of a disconnect, though, just in terms of fundraising. You know, we're talking about the golden age of secondaries, and there's been a lot of fundraising. Everyone's anticipating it to be a great time. 
So just a couple stats on the market. So Prequin noted 46 deals and almost 50 billion of transaction volume through September. Um, and that contrasts with you know, last year, it's about double, uh, more like three quarters of the way through the year. And we're on pace to exceed 2020's record level of 84 billion of, of secondary volume. And on the other hand, when you look at deals getting done, while they're starting to increase, we are seeing a, uh, a decrease in the you know, bid, uh, bid ask spread. Transaction volumes are lower than fundraising. And so, you know, dry powder's been building up. We think there will be an opportunity, uh, but that is taking place. And then just some of the more recent developments in this space, we've been seeing you know, a lot, certainly on the private equity side, about three quarters of all deals done this year have been, you know, plain vanilla, more private equity buyouts across different stages, less so on the venture side. Um, you know, still some concerns about valuation there requires a lot of specialized expertise, as uh, Tom will touch on. Uh, on the real estate side, very little volume, you know, about 4% of deals this year. We're in the real estate sector, you know, just concerns around valuation and overall uncertainty on the outlook for particular areas, particularly when you look at things like office. And then one interesting development has really been around private credit. And we've seen that secondary market develop, you know, very similar to private equity you know, 15 years ago. Um, as private equity has matured and now private credit is starting to mature, then a lot of capital raised, so you're going to have sellers that need liquidity. Uh, you also have uh, investors creating new portfolios where they may want you know, the diversification, increased J-curve mitigation, um, and tailored exposures that you can get by purchasing um, private credit funds on the secondary market. I say one thing to be cautious of, though, because you're basically reaching back and buying, you know, two, three vintage years ago. And in many cases, for private credit, is to really understand and look at the underlying portfolios. Many of those deals were done when, you know, interest rates were lower, but um, you know, covenants were a lot looser. There may be less interest coverage. You know, how are those loans faring today? How are they valued? So a lot of uh, digging to be done, uh, but certainly you know, the opportunities there, and we're seeing a lot of dedicated capital being mm -hmm. raised around that. So. Awesome. Well, Michael, you're the practitioner of the trade because you're actually one of, <laughs> yeah, one of the practitioners of the trade. And uh, so we're just kind of wondering, what are you seeing uh, in the markets for your middle market and also the creativity that it's everybody needs to be creative because there's competition. There's a lot of money chasing everything. So how are you dealing with it and finding good investments? Yes, thanks. So a couple of comments. Um, you know, I, I think our strategy is is a bit unique because uh, we have a a platform that is providing capital to mostly middle market buyout funds across equity and credit, and we have a relatively straightforward approach to secondaries, which involves utilizing our closest relationships that we've developed over a three decade period to get really interesting access to deal flow in what we think are less competitive processes. And the secondary market has evolved to include a number of capital market tools, a number of transaction technologies, which are Difficult to explain probably in the brief amount of time that we have in total here, but our strategy seem has been to focus on a, a, a bit of a, 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 a basic approach to, to finding very high quality businesses with excellent alignment whose investors, LPs, want or need liquidity. And so I would characterize our approach as, as being relatively vanilla, which in my opinion, and in our opinion, in the market environment that we're in today is, is a good one because rates have uh, gone up dramatically, as we all know, and that puts pressure 
on certain investment styles that require leverage to enhance or generate an acceptable return. We've never done that. We don't need that. Um, we also have been, you know, relatively, uh, I, I think, risk averse relative to some of the more exotic betas uh, around venture capital that has um, obviously a lot of beta, but you know, quite quite a bit of potential downside if if those investments you know don't work out uh, quite as planned. And so, we have a strategy that is relatively straightforward, which actually has many, in many ways, become novel because the secondary market has become so sophisticated in utilizing different transaction technologies and various capital markets tools. And that's not an incrimination of those tools or those deal types. Uh, it, it's just, I'm explaining our approach. The state of innovation today for secondaries, however, between different transaction structures. And, and I don't know if the audience would benefit from a little bit of a conversation on what an LP and a GP secondary is. Um, you know, I, I cover both. So may, maybe I'll cover LP. And then, Roche, if you want to cover GP, uh, we, could, we could sort of ham and egg it, as they say in show business. Um, but, you know, an LP transaction is done. We, we've, Michelle touched on elements of this. An LP transaction is done for a number of reasons. And it can be because the endowment or the foundation has been in the fund for 12 years and they said, geez, I thought this would be wrapped up in 10 and I'm still in this fund. And can I, can I get out of this thing? Well, if you go back 15 or 20 years, it was the norm to patiently wait until you received your last distribution and your final K-1. And, and, and the secondaries market was much smaller at that time. And if you fast forward to today, you have pensions and endowments and CIOs that are saying, well, there's a liquid market for these funds. And we've considered pivoting from this side of the room to that side of the room. So why don't we sell that side of the room and then start buying more of that side of the room? And so an LP secondary is a transaction that facilitates that liquidity gathering that it, for that investor that wants or needs it. And it's done by buying out the interest and stepping into that investor's shoes. And there are a variety of very interesting transaction technologies around tr deferrals, um, you know, risk sharing models, synthetic secondaries that have been done. But the, but the base level of it is, I'm taking over your partnership interest. If there's upside to this, I own it. If there's downside to this, I own it. And that is, as Michelle says, about 50% of the secondary market. It's, it's the roots of the conventional secondary market that helps limited partners get liquidity ahead of the final, the final K-1 that comes in the door. It's diversified. You often get a little discount on it or a meaningful discount. We like to say that price is what you pay and quality is what you get, however. So you know, be wary of transactions that are pricing at a very steep discount because the market is reasonably efficient. Um, and you get backward diversification. Uh, you get a more, a more rapid path to uh, getting your capital back on a, you know, on a DPI basis or a distribution to paid in basis. So there's, there's good base roots to that. And, and all that activity that we had with general partners, uh, you know, buying their LP interests led to a natural evolution and conversation with GPs around, well, what, you know, what, what other types of liquidity solutions do you have on the other side of your suit? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to pull on a thread that you just started sewing for me here, which is, what is a secondary, right? It's liquidity in an otherwise illiquid market. Private equity does not have daily, monthly, quarterly, annual, biannual liquidity. It does not exist in this market other than when assets are sold. The solve for that is us. It's, it's the people that you see on this stage. This is what we do. We create liquidity in an otherwise illiquid market. And so, the start of it was that, LP secondaries and folks that had uh, entered into a marriage that they thought was going to be 10 years, that became 12, that became 15, or folks that entered into a 10-year marriage and realized after five years, I suppose as the average American does, that uh, it's time for divorce. Uh, and so they needed to create liquidity here. And so that, that was the sort of evolution of the LP market. And I think what, what we see driving volume, both LP and GP, to just pull this thread further, is that this dearth of liquidity that exists in private markets is, is driving a lot of deal flow. And it's part of the reason that as I sort of made that tongue in cheek joke about golden age of secondaries, it's the golden age of secondaries because LPs need to sell um, distributions. And, and we've got data to bear this out. Distributions in the market are down 
60 to 70% off a of peak in a normal year. 2022 was the first cash flow negative year in private equity in 15 years. 2023 is going to be the second cash flow negative year in private equity in 16 years. That's tough for Can limited partners. Can you define cash flow negative? Yeah, L- LPs are contributing more to their funds than they're receiving in distributions right now. And so uh, that, that's because it's not that they're not that NAVs are going down. It's not that you have a negative return in the industry. I'm not suggesting that. But on a bank account basis, you are net out money in private equity likely this year with a mature program. And so that's creating an imperative for, for liquidity in secondaries. And that's driving a lot of LP volume, which, which you might just covered. Um, and then on the GP led side, this is sort of the, the new technology that's come to exist in secondaries, uh, really actually in response to this. And so it's not really just in response to 2022 and 2023. But if we go back to the COVID era in 2020, uh, we all know this, it, you know, it seems like a day and a decade ago, but the world came to a halt in the first half of 2020, uh, not just for all of us in our personal lives, not just for us in commuting to work, but there was no exit activity happening in the first half of 2020. And, and we didn't know when it was going to happen again. I, you know, I think we can all think back to March of 2020 and laughing and saying, OK, we'll see you in July. We didn't see anybody in July. Uh, and so this dearth of liquidity that existed in private equity facilitated the need for this GP led market. Uh, banks pulled back, right? You know, big syndicated lenders pulled back from loaning to large private equity businesses. The direct lending funds, so these are captive sort of private equity-like funds, slowed down in their ability to lend. Doing a change of control transaction became tough. IPOing became impossible. Strategics got tight on cash. So your sort of three classic exit windows became very challenging for private equity. And so sponsors looked around and they go, well, if I can't sell my business to somebody else, how do I sell it to myself, right? How do I sell this to myself and create liquidity for my LPs? And so... The answer to that was let's create this GP led, this continuation vehicle market that exists right now. And the core of that market is you go out and you find secondary buyers like me, like Mike, like Tom, the people sitting here on the stage. Uh, and you say, will you capitalize a vehicle to acquire this company? And our answer is sure, at a price and at a reasonable set of terms. If you roll all of your carried interest, you roll all of your GP commit, we get really good alignment. So if I win, you win, right? And I, you have to, in order for you to keep winning, I have to win here too. But we sort of negotiate all those terms. And you know what the beauty is? Most of these are not true change of control transactions. And so sponsors get the opportunity to port an existing capital structure, re-up with their bank or their lender if they have to, but an easier conversation with an existing lending source. Um, and they can use that transaction then to solve their core problem with their LPs, right? Because what is private equity? You know, the joke might be it's an investing business. I might tell you on the stage it's a capital raising business at the end of the day. So what is private equity? It's a capital raising business. Uh, if our investment returns look good, we haven't given you money in your bank account, you're not going to invest in our next fund. And so how do we solve that? When we can't sell business to anybody else, we sell them to ourselves and we create liquidity for you, our limited partners. And so that market has grown very quickly over the last three years. Prior to that, there was a GP led market. Uh, it stunk. Uh, most of the deals that existed in the GP led market to that were not great assets with great sponsors that had a liquidity problem. These were zombie 10, 12 year old funds that had not generated carry. Uh, and their partners coming to you and saying, I promise this time will be different. Capitalize this fund, take out my LPs. I promise to you this time will be different. Pay me some fees and carry. Um, those deals worked okay by and large, but were not great. This market has now become best sponsors, best assets, best alignment to solve this liquidity problem. And then the best part of it from my perspective is I think there's a long-term secular change in secondaries right now. These are higher returning deals than the LP side of the market. We're taking more concentrated risk more duration, they have to be higher returning from a pure finance perspective. Uh, but they're higher returning deals. But sponsors have grown to love them too. Super tax efficient, you roll all your carry into a vehicle, you don't pay taxes on it. And by the way, you pay cap gains on carry, I think as everybody in this room knows anyways, super tax efficient. In a normal world, these sponsors would have sold these assets to their competitors or strategic, they would not have gotten the ups on them, there was no go on management fee and carry for them. And so not only is it good for their personal checkbooks, it's good for the firms because they keep generating management fees and carry good for their management teams to keep working with them, their best companies, their best management teams, great alignment, their own reinvestment. Them. I think it's, it's really compelling. And so there's this long term secular change in secondaries where sponsors, even in a better liquidity environment, are going to want to do this. They have an economic motivation to continue to do this. Um, and we think that that drives better long term returns here in secondaries. That's, that's very interesting, because we talked about a diversified portfolio. That's Michael. We're talking about somewhat more concentrated, and that's Matt. And now we're talking about super concentrated. And what is a direct secondary? Yeah, so I like to think of us as kind of the next chapter 
uh, of second of the secondary market. And most of the people on the stage probably aren't old enough to remember. I was a very wet behind the ears venture capitalist back when Dayton Carr up the street here at the Venture Capital Fund of America raised what was one of the very first funds to buy LP secondary interest in venture and growth equity funds. I think his first fund was like a $150 million fund. And now the industry is, what did you say, 80 to $100 billion could be invested this year in these conventional secondaries. And I think maybe the best way to think about the difference in what we do is you heard Michael talk about the limited partners. Uh, you heard uh, Matt talk about the general partners. Well, you think about those two groups of holders. Uh, limited partners are big institutions, right? They're, they're sophisticated financially. They've got perpetual lives. It's the definition of an institution. They've got very deep pockets. They have diversified portfolios. And oh, by the way, they signed up. Every, every time they committed to Kleiner Perkins or to KKR, regardless of whether it was a venture capital or a growth equity or a private credit fund, they signed up for a 10-year ride, knowing that it's probably going to be 15 or 20. Same thing with the general partners that are managing all these funds. They're sophisticated, right? They, they, they know how to buy. They know how to sell. They know what these contracts say. They're in it for the long term. Uh, uh, and they've got fiduciaries. They've all got fiduciaries when they go to transact, when they go to sell or buy, they've got fiduciaries. They have to optimize. So all these transactions are driven by some type of process, right? If they're, if they're not being brokered or auctioned or driving a process, for the most part, they're probably not fulfilling their fiduciary to optimize the price. We're in a very different part of the secondary market. We're dealing directly with the companies that all these investors, whether they're venture or growth equity or private equity, are investing in, the companies on the ground. We focus on companies that are usually backed by growth equity investors or venture capitalists, but they're 10 or 15 years old. These are 50, 100, 200 million dollar revenue companies. They're the gems in these portfolios, the reason people want to do GP-led secondaries or why there's value in the LP secondary. Uh, there's trillions of dollars of pent up private equity sitting in these private companies. We focus on the individual shareholders in those companies. We calculate that there's at least $3 trillion of value today held by ind individual shareholders in these private companies. They're not always the most financially sophisticated holders of securities. Think about the VP of engineering uh, at a, uh, a high growth tech company. Probably a great MIT grad, but may not have taken Finance 101 in his curriculum at MIT. Uh, so they're not necessarily real sophisticated. They don't necessarily have deep pockets. That VP of engineering may be in his first job. He may be sitting on three, four, five million dollars of value or 10, or maybe if it's a founder of a company, he might be sitting on tens of millions or hundreds of millions of value. But did he ever have or her have a big payday or a paycheck? Probably not. So they're probably not sitting on real deep pockets and they probably don't have a diversified portfolio. And most likely, they never signed a piece of paper that said they were signing up for a 10-year deal. And when they did that, they might have been 25 or 30 or 35 years old. But now, 15 years later, after they've created all this value, guess what? They've got bills to pay. And life happens. That's a favorite saying around our shop is life happens. How do you pay the bills? Well, I've got a lot of value here in my share certificates, but that doesn't pay the tuition or the mortgage, et cetera. So... We focus on providing liquidity to those individual shareholders uh, in these kind of high octane, high growth. Uh, we happen to focus, there's lots of different ways to slice and dice our market as well, but we focus on technology and technology enabled service businesses. Uh, and there are a lot of these shareholders, as you can imagine, uh, Liquidity, for all the same reasons, is, is precious right now. The IPOs aren't happening. The IPOs that everybody thought was going to happen in 2022, uh, that window was shut. The SPAC window was shut six months or a year before the IPO window uh, was shut. The financial buyers uh, have slowed down. And importantly, a lot of these owners, these, these 
financial sponsors don't want to sell in today's market. It's not a good time to sell if you don't have to. Again, we think the best companies don't need to be sold. They're profitable. They're self-funding their growth. They're growing 20, 30, 40, 50% a year. Uh, why sell now if you don't have to? Uh, but those individual shareholders who aren't in the driver's seat on the board of those companies have nowhere to go. So uh, we think that that uh, it, it's, it's a, uh, uh, a really attractive, we think it's probably the most inefficient segment of the market to be in today. Uh, I think that's what's happened in the conventional market is a really great proxy for what's likely uh, to evolve. I think 10 years from now, looking back uh, on the segment we're in, I don't think it'll ever rival uh, the, the size of the conventional market, but I think we're in very early innings and it's just a really exciting time. I think it's there's no question this is a real coming of age for the secondary market across all of these strategies. So it's a real fun time to be doing it. Thank you, Tom. But let me ask a question. Um, you know, just it's not as easy. And we all say the secondary is great. It's a great market for all the reasons we are talking about. So let's talk, uh, unpack it one by one. We'll start with you, Tom. So these are companies that you're buying $100 million in revenues already. But these are not small companies. They've been around being held by some venture capitalist or some growth equity guy for the last 10 years. The markets for the last five, 10 years have been very kind to technology companies. Why were they not sold then? And why is this a good time? For how are you able to access them now? Maybe they were not available before. So just what has happened in the, in the venture or growth equity landscape I just thought you could just about sell anything that you wanted, call it technology, and the stock price goes up. <laughs> no, it's a good question. And we've been doing this, by the way, with our fund for a dozen years now. And we've been doing well in good markets because there's always a seller, yeah. right? And, and you don't sell your bad assets. They don't have value. You sell what has value uh, if you really need liquidity. So... Uh, so we have found that it's a good market to be in or good strategy to have in good markets and bad. I think maybe the best way to answer your question is by an example. I'll just give you an mm -hmm. example uh, out of our portfolio. Uh, it's a deal I've worked on over the past year. We, uh, we do a lot of we spend 80 percent of our time doing research on sectors and markets and companies that we think we'd want to be invested in. And it was back in 2018. Uh, we did an internal white paper on what was then in kind of an embryonic market called the master data management market. It's kind of an esoteric, geeky, propellerhead uh, term. But big companies, big Fortune 100 and 1,000 companies, given all the proliferation of data and all the proliferation of applications, need a single point of truth for everything they know about their customers, everything they know about their employees and everything they know about their products. Uh, so master data management is, is, a, is a, a platform that helps companies uh, uh, create and, and inventory and manage that single source of truth. And we identified a little company uh, on the West Coast called Reltio, which was an up and cover in that market. Uh, there's one public company in the market called Informatica, which is a legacy player. It's a very well-regarded public company. Uh, and RELTIO was, you know, at the time, a 20, 30, 40 million dollar revenue company, exciting company, but a typical venture-backed company. NEA was one of their, everybody knows NEA if you're in the venture market, was one of their early venture investors. And uh, uh, so they had good investors, good syndicate, but the company was burning cash and growing quickly and wasn't yet at a stage where we would be interested to invest. They, like many companies did, and one of the things that makes it such a great time for us to be investing, in 2019, 2020, and 2021, equity capital was basically free. Mm -hmm. And if you were a CFO or a CEO of a private company and you didn't take money in 2019, 20 or 21, you know, you, you, you need some help because it was, it's never been cheaper and may never be again cheaper yeah. than it was in 2019, 20 and 21. So companies are raising capital. There wasn't really a need at the time for liquidity. Uh, and companies were taking this, you know, they were growing quickly. Reltio was same boat. Uh, and they were doing everything they needed to do to be a public company. 
uh, in their view, that was going to happen in 2022. And they had, uh, you know, hired the Take Public board, hired the Take Public management team, ready to go. And then the world changed. Uh, and all of a sudden, what Goldman Sachs, I know there's some Goldman folks in the room, and Morgan Stanley would have told that company three years ago, which is you really need to be a hundred, hundred fifty million dollar revenue rule of forty. You guys may have heard about the rule of forty, which is kind of a magic quantitative measure on value for tech companies. You need to be a rule of forty company with a hundred, hundred fifty million in revenue before you can be a legitimate IPO. Well, Reltio was at a hundred million last year. They're at one hundred thirty five million today. Uh, but that bar has changed. Of course, the, the market's closed now, but what the bankers are saying now is you really need to be 250 uh, to be a legitimate Goldman uh, IPO. So now all of a sudden, from the company's standpoint, that IPO is pushed out two or three years. And this is happening across the entire landscape. But one of the key things that makes the environment different is that the good companies raise that free capital in 19, 20, and 21. And the really good companies locked it away and said, we need to get there on what we have because we're not gonna see equity capital at those prices again. Uh, so it's, uh, it's really that in the, uh, somebody mentioned the financial crisis. You can even go back to the bubble, which you know in the tech bubble, you had just a lot of bad business models that were funded and that broke and then you know, the, the, the emperor had no clothes. Uh, in the wake of the financial crisis, which was kind of a credit-driven financial crisis, you, had a, you didn't have the, the, the abundance of ca equity capital that had, had funded these businesses. They were over-leveraged in many cases, which caused the correction. Today, you've got really high-quality businesses that have been well-funded, but there just simply is no exit environment, which creates this unique need for what we've simply said. Secondaries is just providing that much-needed liquidity, regardless of who the stakeholder is. Awesome. Great, great explanation. I have another um, question for the panel, and uh, anybody can answer that. So we are in a situation where liquidity is, why secondaries? Because uh, it's, liquidity is very hard to come by. People do not have liquidity from, nothing is being sold, or fewer deals are being done, as, as Michelle was talking about it, so they can't exit the deals. So LPs are looking for liquidities and, and, and GPs are looking for liquidity and secondary is a way to create that. Uh, do you have a sense of com compared to historical years, are they selling their better deals because they want to get the deal done? Or are they selling their dogs because everybody says it's a great time to be in secondaries and they've raised a lot of money? Mm. Uh so, so um, I'll go and you guys should all go because I think everybody's going to have a perspective on this. And I'm going to get a little bit wonkish, so forgive me for this. Um, we track it and the short answer to the question is yes, people have to sell good funds to maintain good pricing. And, and, and the way that we think about this, and I'm going I'm to get a little bit wonkish, like I said. So in a normal year, pre-2020, you would get 95 cents to par. So if a zero to 5% discount relative to your last valuation on a private equity fund, LP interest to sell it. You would typically be selling your non-core funds. For the, in, in a normal market environment, what you're doing is you're either selling because you've got a distressed need. Um, those were fewer and further between for 15, the last 15 years. Uh, or you're selling because you're doing sort of portfolio rebalancing and or management. You've got non-core names. And the, the trend in this industry, in a few words, is fewer but larger. Right? We're going to commit to fewer managers but write larger checks into them. We're going to do... Uh, bigger bets with our highest conviction GPs. And what that means is that, uh, and I'll use a metaphor because we're in a place called this, uh, you'll get left on the cutting room floor, right? And so you've got managers that are non-core managers that you don't intend to continue with. And if you can get a zero to 5% discount for them, you're going to sell them, right? So dogs unfair, but you're probably selling your BB pluses for 95 cents on the dollar. Um, and we've got this internal qualitative measure at Stepstone that we call top pick, potential outperformer, performer. We segment the entire private markets, every fund that's coming to market in the next two years, with those rankings. Um, and the way it works out is top 10% ends up with stop pick, the next 20, 25% ends up with potential high performer, everybody else sits in performer. Um, and in a normal market environment, so that 95 to par environment, what we saw is 15-ish percent of the LP transaction volume was top picks and potential high performers. And so, you know, 85% of it was you selling what we would define as not super high conviction names. Uh, fast forward to right now, prevailing market prices have come back a little bit. We were talking about this this morning. 
I would say still off of peaks by it depends on the fund, but um, let's say anywhere from 500 to 1000 basis points. If you do that quality adjusted like for like, uh, and this is where the see that's both wonkish and fanciful because there's no such thing as quality adjusted like for like, but I'm going to do it anyways. Um, if you look at the proportion of funds coming now, it's sort of 30 to 40% top picks and personal shot performers for us. And so the quality is very far up. If you look at closed deal volume, so what happens in the secondary market right now is we'll close $100 billion of volume this year. We'll have $200 billion in actionable deal volume. So if you look at closed deal volume, not just what comes to market, 50 to 60% of those are potential performers and top picks for us. Um, and those funds were not the funds trading at 95 to par five years ago. Those funds were trading at par plus. They were trading at par to 110. And so, you know, if the market today is, let's call it 88 cents among friends, it's 88 cents for those very high conviction funds that exist right now that used to be par plus funds. And so we're probably 10 to 15 points off of peaks. What happens now is those B pluses sell in the low 80s. In the Bs, they don't sell at all, at all. There is no active secondary market for those B non-core funds right now because there's no price that makes sense for sellers. Um, at least that, that's been that's been our view. I'm curious what you guys have seen too. That's good. Good to get a perspective on a, another way that investors stratify the the funds universe. Uh, to your question on quality, um, you know, maybe taking this this question from the GP secondary perspective, which. Matt provided a great overview of a few minutes ago. Um, what that involves is, is, a, is a general partner that has maybe 16 total portfolio companies spread between three funds, and, and they, can, they can continue to, to, to hold, or they can choose to sell those portfolio codes every day. And for a subset of the portfolio, they'll choose to sell it. And for, for the reasons that have been touched on at surface level in this conversation this afternoon, it's a tough time to sell portfolio companies and control exits. And what we've seen and what we focus on, and I think Matt would, would agree from his perspective on the GP-led secondary market is general partners are saying, okay, I can't sell that company, but I have this big audience of limited partners that wants liquidity and may need liquidity to fund their, their private equity program, which is now strained because there haven't been distributions in a significant way for two years. And so as the general partner says, well, I have to supply some liquidity to my LPs to keep them happy. What is a method that I can do that with that doesn't involve me selling any of these choice 16 assets at prices that I would deem to be temporarily unattractive? Meaning if I wait only a year, I think I can get not 200 million, but 275 million for that portfolio co. And so what we're seeing is general partners are looking at that audience of 16 companies and saying, okay, I'm going to choose my crown jewel asset that I find to be the type of business that I would like to own forever if I can, or if I could, but I cannot because it's in a Roman numeral fund that has a defined end date that has these pesky investors that want capital back. And, and so, you know, what we focus on are trying to find the, the best sponsors that own these niche companies that they would like to own forever if they, they, they could, but they can't. And so we provide them a mechanism to buy it out from the fund at a, at a price that we find, you know, fair and acceptable to us, but defensible if it ends up on the cover of the Wall Street Journal. And, you know, we, we have done some tracking of this, which I'll, I'll give you this anecdote, which is that if you look at the dollar amount that the general partner put in the fund, so so day one, the fund is 100, I'll use very base, basic math here to make it easy. But if, if on day one, it's a $100 million fund seven years ago, the GP commits $2 million or 2%, some more, let's just use that number. And then they, then they take that crown jewel asset four years later, five years later, and say, we want to do this thing called a continuation vehicle with you people on the panel and your funds, your secondary capital will support that. What we've done is we've tracked the dollar commitment that those general partners have in the individual deal. And in the transactions we focus on, it tends to be about four to one. So, so the GP committed $2 million to a fund five years ago. Okay, that's a meaningful number. $2 million is a lot of money. Well, then today, they're doing a continuation vehicle on this crown jewel asset and they're putting $8 million of their own money, capital at risk, that if the transaction underperforms, 
they're going to they're going to share in that pain in a disproportionate way because they could have taken that $8 million and sold the company. Maybe they wouldn't get that $8 million in total because it's a dislocated credit market today. But it's a lot of money. And the transactions that we're focusing on, Seema, to your point, are those deals where the sponsor wants to, to roll 100%, where the management wants to roll 100%. We did a transaction in 2022 where the CEO founder of the company chose to roll a eight-figure number into the company at the new price because in that case, this CEO said, there's no better way for me to, to position my own capital than in my company that I control. And even though it's at a 2.5 or 2.75 X, what the old, old money price was, he'll put that money back in at, at today's price. So we're focused on quality. There are you know troubled asset deals that get done we don't focus on that. We don't like the alignment. And, you know, stylistically, we have a very focused approach to what we do. Um, and so we're focused on quality. We've seen, I, I think, the, the barometer for quality in the GP-led secondary market has, I, I would say, almost universally moved up in terms of in terms of quality. I, was say, I think the GP-led market, the quality thing is so much more acute than it is on the LP side. The, the GP-led market is, I'm going to do the tagline. It's truly best sponsors, best assets, best alignment. I mean, we're seeing weighted average 10 to 12% GP commits on these things versus 2% in a fund. Um, and when I said there's no market for B funds on the LP side, there's barely a market for A minus assets on the GP led side. And so the quality is much higher. And I, in part, that is because our job on this stage for 20 years has been secondaries as a risk averse equity investment class. And so if we're going to do this, and we're going to take that isolated risk and we're going to not buy in at a discount. We're going to take incremental duration. They need to be the best. I mean, it's the same thing that you guys have been doing now for 20 years at this point. And we're sort of, sort of catching up on the GP-led CV side. But um, that that scheme is is that quality quotient is that much higher on that side of the market. Yeah, just maybe to comment on the LP side. So we've seen a lot of LPs come to market with portfolios and funds. And a lot of times they end up not transacting. They don't like the price that they're offered. So they pull back. You know, some deals are getting done, some very large deals. In fact, today it was announced that Ardian purchased a $2.1 billion portfolio from CPP. So some deals are getting done, but in many cases they're not. So then what happens? Oftentimes the seller goes back and maybe changes the mix a bit. So they'd wanted to get rid of their legacy investments. Um, often their legacy for various reasons. It doesn't always mean performance. could just be manager that it's gotten too large. They don't like the alignment anymore. Someone else, you know, another CIO uh, developed those relationships. Many reasons they could be considered legacy. Uh, so that's what they'd like to sell. But in some cases, they have to go back and add a sweetener, if you will, some you know, very attractive funds in order to get the deal done. So they can either add those funds to the mix and go back to market. Or often what we're seeing is very structured transactions where they sell a strip. Okay, maybe we'll sell... 25, 50% of a manager we really like, you know, a couple of those just to help get rid of the ones that we don't want to uh, be stuck with. So we're seeing a lot of creativity on the structuring end, but also helps minimize the discount from an optical perspective. So LPs have a board they have to answer to, and they're saying, why are we selling, you know, funds at a discount by structuring? They can effectively reduce that, deferring some of the proceeds for often a couple of years. Um, and then just on the GP side, you know, completely agree that the quality of sponsors and assets has markedly improved. You know, continuation funds used to be called bridge funds or the provenance of, of zombie funds. But now it's really the GPs who don't want to part with their best assets. You know, strong GPs, they want to hold on rather than just selling to another sponsor. That being said, I think there are some questions around the alignment and it really comes down to the details of how these deals are done. You know, are the LPs you know, given offered a status quo option? Can they keep their asset in the fund? Uh, do they have to roll? Are they being asked to roll at a discount? Um, how is that valuation set? You know, now the SEC is requiring a fairness opinion on continuation deals. That wasn't always the case, um, but even then, you know, how is that value set for a private asset? Um, the GP is on both sides of the transaction. They're effectively 
taking an asset out of a fund, selling it into another vehicle. So if they're resetting their economics, they're motivated to have a low price, right? They can then get a more upside when they sell. So really need to assess these yeah. very carefully. And yeah. there are conflicts along the way. Um, also depends on who's coming into the deal. Are there a lot of fees? Who's paying the fees? A uh, number of other questions. Um, often LPs are given you know, a week or two to evaluate these continuation fund deals that come with 200 pages of documentation. The LP agreement, it's basically re-underwriting an investment um, with very little time. So LPs do not love them, uh, but from a return perspective, if you're investing in continuation deals, they can certainly be attractive. Awesome. One last question. I think we're almost at time and time just flew. We thought we wouldn't need more than 40 minutes. And at the top of the hour, we are still going strong. But last question, because we are running out of time. Are you just kind of think about it? A fundraising environment is harder than it has been in the past. So what kind of, not just secondary funds, maybe it also applies to the primary funds. Who is getting the assets? Are these the large guys or are these the smaller guys? And where do you think is a better opportunity? Anybody can take this question. There's some bias probably here yeah. at, at, at the at the table um, or at the 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 dais up here. Um, I'll start. I mean, we have a niche strategy, so we don't compete against what what was what was Goldman's last secondary fund? Twelve billion, twenty twenty billion. Okay, that's that's like pretty big. Um, we are raising a billion dollar fund to focus on finding really the highest quality companies, whether they're in an LP secondary, a GP secondary, we don't do venture direct, so we won't be competing there. Um, focus on the, the, the middle part of the market uh, where we have exceptional coverage. Um, it, I think that there's a place, SEMA, for all LPs, whether you're, you know, Adia and you need to put $2 billion to work yeah. per year, you can find a home for that in the secondary market. Um, probably a little more difficult to, to partner with us if that's what you need to deploy. Um, so, you know, we quite like that, that middle segment of the market where there are thousands of high quality companies backed by thousands of, of very talented sponsors, uh, but are just a little too small for a Goldman $20 billion secondary fund, you know, to take interest in an $85 million waste management company, you know, based in the Midwest. Whereas for us, you know, we know how to extract value from that transaction. We know the partners. We may know the management. And so that's where we're focused. But I think there's lanes for for probably, you know, every, every LP. But I'm biased, so I like the middle cycle. Well, so I was going to say, I mean, in, in UX, you have this same data. And I think you alluded to this earlier, Michelle. The The reality is um, <clears throat> if you could, if you have the stomach for it and the team to identify these managers, the small and middle markets outperformed the large markets. Now there's more vol, right? I mean, I always refer to it as this shark bite because I think about teaching it to my kids, which is there's more vol in the small market. There's more He's teaching less his kids about second. Yeah, exactly. Well, I'm a very boring parent, um, but uh, you know, there's more vol but more absolute return the further down market you go. And so, if you've got a team that can mine the small and middle markets and find those managers. Uh, we found those to be very attractive. That's been true across market cycles. And, and I think we've got a bias towards small and middle market as well in this market environment, which is there's more action, exit optionality. The, the big guys are tied to big strategics or to IPOs to get out of their businesses. Um, small guys, you buy a business with $10 million of EBITDA and $100 million of revenue. The reality is that can get funded today. That can get debt funded by a direct lender. It can get bought by a middle market private equity firm. It can get bought by a smaller strategic. And so you know, in addition to the absolute return part, I think we have more shots on goal in terms of creating liquidity in a market environment that for the next 18 to 24 months is going to suffer from a lack of liquidity. Thank you, everybody. This was a great panel. Bye-bye. Thank you.